says, get that India, big boy. What a shot! Campbell Killer! Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020. Joining me for what we thought initially was a quiet week in the NRL and for the Parramatta Reels, but fast forward 24 hours when we had our original recording and then it got all balked and we had to re-record today, it turns out there's a bit of news in the cycle, which is a fantastic thing to actually have that to talk about. So joining me to what uh, to cover what should be a pretty uh, full slate now, my good mates, 60s and Quint. Fellas, when I spoke to you yesterday, it was a bit of a quiet podcast. I think we actually clocked in under 52 minutes, but like I said, fast forward 24 hours and I reckon we're going to be cracking that one hour mark with ease. Yes, it is take two. But you know what? The other thing too, 40, is that in the 24 hours since I've been up to Eels HQ at Kellyville, caught another field session, uh, spent a little bit of time in the office uh, catching up with people and um, getting a few things organised. So a little bit of extra information that I can add to tonight's podcast. And uh, let's hope we've got fingers crossed that the whole thing doesn't crash and burn again tonight, <laughs> and it will be it will be able to get it out to our listeners tomorrow. Clint, how are you doing, mate? Well, just like twenty four hours ago, gents, um, and still confirm Christmas shopping is still done. And a friendly reminder to our listeners: as you listen to this, most likely on your Thursday afternoon, um, Black Friday is approaching, as is Cyber Monday. Get out and get yourself a good deal, so you're not paying full price come Christmas time. Yeah, good time to be investing in uh, pretty much anything these days, but originally it was the tech sector, right? But now everything mm. everything's on sale, so it's a good time to get your Christmas proceeds or spoil a little bit on yourself if you've been a, a good boy or a good girl this year. Uh, but as always... I'm, I'm looking forward, by the way, I'm looking forward to the day when Black Friday actually falls on like a Friday the 13th, <laughs> so they can say that it truly really is Black Friday. <laughs> it's, um, well, I, think the, I think Friday the 13th was in October, this year yes, so it you was. had an october was, 13th yeah. going into into halloween in the same month yep we're getting very american with our celebrations we are. And uh, yeah. now we are. <laughs> that's probably a sore point with some people out there it's a little bit of a sore point with me but right at the moment live and let live yep <laughs> and before we get into all the footy talk boys as always a quick shout out to the sponsors of the show big swing golf north mead and star partners real estate auburn norellan and Parramatta, doing wonderful things for tct all right, let's get into it, boys. News team, assemble! Well, fellas, we're going to kick off as usual with our Eels news, with the latest out of paradise. And... Of course, the news came through yesterday that Nathan Brown is departing the Eels. He was the Elite Pathways Coaching Director at Parramatta. He's held that post for roughly about 12 months. He's moving the family up to the Gold Coast. And uh, we obviously, we wish him well. We've developed quite a good rapport with Nathan. He's helped us in our coverage of the junior representative season during 2023, hopped on the podcast, was very giving of his time for us. And, uh, you know, one of, I, I think one of nature's gentlemen, he, uh, when we recorded last night, and it, it didn't come through, <laughs> unfortunately, but when we recorded last night, I made a little bit of a comparison to Joey Grimer in that he always seemed to be in a positive mood. He always seemed to be happy, Nathan Brown. And I think... That's a really good quality to have when you're talking about pathways football. It's, you know, these are young players that are developing their um, their football skills. They're developing into understanding what it means to be a full-time footballer. You know, they don't want the weight of the world on their shoulders. They're going to have, you know, if they progress into being professional footballers, they're going to have a lot of pressures that come their way anyway. So... I think it's good to have someone with um, his experience, but also his demeanour as well. I'm sure he knows when to get tough with people, and but also when to be just that 
approachable fellow that young players know they can go to for advice. Um, I sent him. I did send him a message yesterday when the news came through about him departing, just to wish him well and to thank him for his time in assisting uh, the Cumberland Throw with our coverage of junior reps. And um, he uh, responded uh, as I expected that he would, which was, uh, he said, oh, always a pleasure, mate. And then I was up at Kellyville today and in walks Nathan Brown. And I said to him, oh, you're still here. And uh, he informed me that, yes, he's going to be there till Christmas. Um, and uh, I think he is looking forward to a farewell party, or at least the Christmas <laughs> party anyway, as he indicated. He's he's not going without a party. So, um <laughs> anyway, that's um, that's. I, I guess the thing is, John, uh, you'd probably echo my sentiments about uh, his his support for what we were doing during the year, and um, and every every bit of feedback that we had from mm. be it staff or or players in the pathway si- system was nothing but positive about Nathan. Yeah, everything you heard was about how personable and approachable he was, and the advice that he would give you, and the guidance that he would provide in that capacity um, as the coaching director of the Elite Pathway. So he did a bang-up job while he was here. It's going to be a real shame to lose him, uh, whether it's uh, if, whether he's lost to the game for a bit or, or going to work on the Gold Coast, we don't know. But, you know, you wish him, he's wishing the best in his future endeavours and, you know, can only hope that we can uh, do a good job replacing him because he's been a, a fantastic part of the Pathways. Yeah, Clint, do you see someone like Josh Hodson? Because it... it it sort of looked like in him coming straight into the uh, pathways that he might be being groomed to be the next cab off the rank in in Nathan Brown's job. Do you see that happening? Do you think there'll be a, a at some point that he will take on that responsibility? Well, there's certainly an opportunity for him to do so, right? And, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a, a very intelligent player in Josh Hodgson, you know, and, and, and you noted well throughout last year's preseason. Uh, going into the 2023 season, um, the, the, the incredible value that Josh was adding off the field um, for players. And, you know, you can only imagine someone of his pedigree would be adding even more value for players um, in, in the in the, um, in the the junior system, in the, in the pathway system. So, um, yeah, uh, I, absolutely. I could see someone like him, um, not necessarily right away, but certainly within um, time, taking on a position like that. So, um, you know, he, he's someone that already adds tremendous value in what he's doing with the junior teams at the moment. It seems only natural over the course of time that he would um, be, av- or hopefully be available for an opportunity like that. Well, that gets the departures out of the way in terms of the Eels. There's a whole lot to talk about in terms of arrivals. Now, first cab off the rank, and this was news that broke today. So our podcast going awry last night has allowed us to talk about this today. Steve Georgialis has been appointed as the Eels NRLW coach for the next two years. Good news, John? Yeah, I don't think there's any way to see this, but good news. They've gone out, got an experienced hand, someone that's been around the NRL, around reserve grade, been in an NRL uh, head coach or interim head coach capacity as well as an assistant head coach. So he brings a lot of experience to a young team a team that has plenty of talent but probably needs to be sort of, you know, smithed and hammered into proper shape to to be a real contender. And I think we've got a lot of the talent in place, but with a good head coach now in position, we can go and recruit and uh, augment the team and really make a charge in season 2024. Yeah, he certainly has a wealth of experience behind him in the uh, coaching ranks. Um, Clint, your take? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's um, a, a great pickup, to be perfectly honest. And, um, you know, just to um, echo both your sentiments here, um, th- that experience is going to be incredibly beneficial. You know, um, he, Steve George Alice is someone who's been around the game for a, a, a long time. Um, you know, he successfully coached in lower grades. I think he's won a, a New South Wales Cup Premiership or two. Um, likewise, spent plenty of time um, being an assistant um, in in the Penrith system as well. And as far as I understand from the um, the, the Eels press release, yeah, he's, it's, it's a dual I mean, capacity. He's, he's the appointing. coaching director. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. taking over from so, Nathan so he'll Brown. be Nathan Brown's successor. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you'd imagine he'd be the uh, the senior 
sort of on border for someone like Josh Hodgson long term. Mm. But yeah, he's going to be serving in two capacities for the club, which is uh, good to see because right now the NRLW isn't a full season program in terms of the NRL or across the NRL, which means that there is plenty of time for him to juggle the two programs, which almost run perfectly adjacent, don't they? Yeah, from, from, from a calendar perspective, it's, it's sort of, you know, there's a very natural flow that exists there. Yeah, so, I mean, in, in the future when we get the NRLW up to full competitive speed alongside the NRL, you're not going to be able to do that sort of thing, but right now it works out quite nicely. So, uh, George Alice, I mean, the that sort of coaching journey that he's walked upon that we just spoke about uh, brings a lot of nuance and experience and understanding to uh, a job like the coaching director of Elite Pathways, so... He'll be good for the young boys and girls in our pathways, whether it's SG Ball, Tasha Gale, Harold Matthews, the talent squads. So, yeah, really cool. Well, look, a good friend of mine, Eva, is Steve's cousin. And uh, I, I've met Steve a couple of times through um, Eva. And obviously, he's a, he's a great bloke. Um, but she's, Eva is a massive Parramatta supporter. And uh, when I messaged her tonight about Steve finally arriving where he should be at Parramatta Reels, <laughs> she said, the lad is Parramatta uh, born and bred, so he should be at Parramatta. So there you go. He's, oh, uh, nice. he's, uh, he's born and grew up in, uh, in Parramatta territory. So good to see Steve finally coming across to the blue and gold, you're bound to make certain members of your extended family happy, Steve. And uh, we're looking forward to being able to catch up with you and uh, talk NRLW with you uh, later in the year. But uh, before then, who knows, mate, we might have to um, make some inquiries about getting Steve onto the podcast to talk Pathways Rugby League before then. I think that'll be the, uh, the next step of our contact with Steve. Okay, next is a rumour. Curtis Scott. He's rumoured to be heading to the Parramatta Reels on a train and trial contact uh, 40. Yeah, uh, uh, he's obviously had a lot of legal issues off the field. Um, and uh, there's no easy way to spin it. He, he's going to be a polarising pickup. There'll be a lot of fans that won't be too happy about it, and I don't blame them. Um, you know, there becomes a lot of baggage. Um, but uh, Rugby League is a game that you know likes to give people second-plus chances. Um, yeah, and Eels have a need for outside backs. He'll add a lot of depth at the centre position in, in specific. Uh, but, yeah, it's, we, 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 we were close to signing before, so it's no surprise that we're still interested. Um, and you can only hope uh, that if this is true, he embraces the opportunity that's been given to him, like Eels, but had, uh, Eels before him, in Danny Wicks, Manu Ma'u, Kenny Edwards, uh, guys that had very checkered past coming to the club but rebuilt themselves uh, on the field, off the field, and uh, carved out really strong careers as Eels. Uh, Clint, we know that the Eels like to do their due diligence on potential recruits. We want them to be the right sort of individual to join the football program. So if he does join us, can we be confident that... Uh, everything's been ticked off and that um, we're expecting him to be a positive addition to the club. We'd certainly like to assume so, you know, and um, every professional organisation has its checks and balances in place. So, you know, I'm just going to park the point about his past and and we're going to assume that that's being done because we all know uh, that, that it is. Um and you look at Curtis Scott purely from the lens of a player. He fits the prototype of of um, outside back that we like. Fits um, at about six two, six three, somewhere between ninety five and hundred kilos. He's only just turned twenty six, so there's still some football ahead of him. Um, and um, and he's a, a, a classic Brad Arthur project as well. So you know, um, you, you you throw all of all of that into the mix and the fact that we need someone as an outside back. There's the obvious link to Zali Faye in our NRLW team who um, is Curtis Scott's partner. Um, you know, we talk about being a development club and a family club. Um, you know, there's um, obviously a little bit of a link and a connection there um, in that regard. So, um, look, you know, um, assuming those checks and balances are in place and he passes the protocols of both the club and the NRL, 
then you know um, it it could be a shrewd investment. But yeah, time will tell, and it's, it's obviously um, it's it's obviously something that's still up in the air and and speculative at this point. Yeah, and the train and trolley, the, um, the, those those particular players, well, they can be used. I think it's from after round ten onwards. So we had some of the new rules kicking in, which is the old development contracts, which are now called the supplementary list, and they can be used from round one. Uh, train and trialers can be used from round 10 onwards unless, of course, the club is going through an injury crisis and applies for dispensation to be able to use a player that's outside the top 30 and the supplementary list. And uh, I don't know whether... uh, Well, we do know that last year, for example, that Parramatta certainly hit their uh, second-tier signings, their uh, train and trial signings, uh, when we uh, look to use uh, players outside of that, and Brendan Hands was the perfect example of that, where he was what I think it was round two, round was it four, round, two, round four. Okay, well, I know it was very early in the season that uh, Brendan got his run in first grade. So now, speaking of that level of signing, this the next two that we want to talk about is probably just a step below that. So you've got your train and trialers who they come along, they'll, they can trial full time, uh, train full time and they have a certain amount of money that they can, that they receive um, throughout the season to train full time. It's not, and not the same sort of coin as, the base level NRL player, but it's deemed enough that it could support them to be a uh, full-time trainer at the club. Uh, these next signings that Forty's going to mention uh, aren't quite at that level. They're players that are Ron Massey Cup level. Forty, can you fill us in on the names of those players? Yeah, we picked up a couple of outside backs, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I know at least one is from the West Tigers. Uh, Jordan Hill and Liam Scalari. Uh, Hill comes with a, a little bit of a, not hype, but interest. Uh, seems to be a, a talented speedster out wide, but has had issues with injury. So rolling the dice on a second-tier signing is never a bad thing. So be interesting to see where he plays out in Scolari. Um, I have to wait and see how he plays, but Hill definitely comes in with at least a, a bit of a watch this space sort of a energy right now. Yeah, and we see a, we saw a number of players that were elevated from uh, the Wenty Ron Massey Cup team last year. Uh, We had a couple of uh, wingers and a middle forward that were running around for Parramatta in the New South Wales Cup when the injury crisis hit really full on. Well, I guess it was a a combination of injury and suspension last year because we certainly featured on both counts in 2023. When I say last year, I mean last season. Um, Okay, that, that takes us out of the new arrivals. A uh, couple of familiar faces, fellas, returned to training this week. And just to let you know, that being Dylan Brown and Micah Sivo. Dylan was there from Monday. Micah was there today. We also had a couple of other faces. We um, we had Brock Parker uh, coming in. I believe he's doing a day a week for... Uh, he, he's been elevated from uh, the Jersey flag um, side. Um, getting a little bit of an NRL preseason, and uh, we saw Ethan Martin, who'd been out for a few days. Um, I think he a bit of soreness. He's getting back into training uh, today, so he was out there on the field today. So it was quite a big, quite a large number of players out there on the field today. Uh, I saw, did see Gutho come down onto the sidelines and just watch them going through their paces. He's obviously going through his rehab. Uh, it must be driving him crazy. You know, it's <laughs> he's, like, not, he's not out there smashing everyone in the aerobic conditioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We could see him up there on uh, the uh, on the exercise bike, watching training, and uh, it was described that he was leading the peloton out there. He was going <laughs> hell for leather on on the exercise bike. Uh, you just can't imagine Gutho doing anything other than looking at whatever he's doing, just belting it up. And uh, so it was, I believe, on the exercise bike today. But, look, good to see uh, the players back where I think 
then that only leaves us Will Penasini due to come back. Um, and uh, he's already been on social media about uh, being uh, back at a couple of his haunts uh, around the district. So we know he's back home. Uh, he's probably keen to get back into it. Uh, his his brother, uh, Richie, uh, put up a, uh, a clip from training today where Ethan Martin uh, was uh, received the ball uh, heading down the sideline. <laughs> anyone that's seen Ethan Martin knows he's quite an elusive runner. And he was he went basically from full pelt to almost like uh, hit the hammer, yeah. stopping on a dime, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where he just he just was instantly came to a full halt, and it brought <laughs> it meant poor old Sean Russell, who who was hearing across field, just hit the it just went he hit the turf trying to trying to adjust. So there was footage of the from the uh, drone of that, uh, which was uh, posted up on the socials today. So it was uh, the players, when it happened, the players really enjoyed it. It, it happened just in front of where we were watching from. And uh, yeah, there were certainly a few laughs that were had there. So um, yeah, look, it's, it's terrific when that footage that's taken at training is allowed to be shared by the players out there on the social media. Uh, especially when it comes to things like that, so you can you can see the players having a bit of laugh about what happens at training. Now, uh, something important, and Clint, I'm going to throw to you because the Eels have had a very strong focus on their well-being program. They've the staff that work in that space in the club are second to none, um, and it, it's. It's something that the focus is on from uh, pathways all the way through to NRL and NRLW. And, uh, Clint, there's a couple of things you're going to talk to us about in regard to that. Yeah, there's been a real evolution, obviously, not just in um, at the Eels or in rugby league, but across uh, wider society, particularly in the Western world, in relation to mental health and, and, and prioritising it. And, you know, obviously our eels are no different. And um, for the first time in the club's history, um, all pathway staff have undertaken mandatory mental health first aid training. Now, it isn't new to a lot of the staff because a lot of them have done it off their own bat beforehand just goes to show the commitment that, that the pathway staff have towards the betterment of the players that come through our systems. But, you know, it, it, it's obviously sending a strong message about the, the values and the ethos of the club that this is now an expectation that if you're going to be an employee at whatever level on the club and you're um, having um, regular interaction with players, you're going to ha uh, undertake um, mental health first aid. So um, a really, really positive move by the club. And, you know, it, it's something that dovetails really nicely into... Um, what we expect to see in the new year is a documentary from our own Sean Lane about uh, about just that, about mental health in sport and, and, and athletes, where he's, uh, I understand, travelled across the, the world um, over the off-season and getting some insights from some um, athletes from some of the biggest sporting organisations um, um, all over Europe and I think the US as well. Uh, anyone who's watched the news on uh, Channel 9 Sport over the last week or so probably would have seen a little snippet with him with um, Emma Lawrence where he he detailed uh, or, or I should say gave gave a quick overview rather of the um, of the travels and the documentary coming up as as well as um, the challenges that his uh, own father has experienced you know it's interesting that they use the term uh, first aid because I guess just like with uh, a, a physical injury, or incident with something that occurs that if you've had first aid training, you it, it's I guess it's well it's designed for people who are nearby when an incident happens, mm. and you and you can uh, offer or provide the assistance to the level that you have been trained at to um, help the person get through that moment until um, more professional people are able to. Uh, come in and to assist the person. So um, I, I guess that it comes with a, a bit of training with, for a recognition of the signs. Um, if someone comes to you, that you can provide that referral to uh, people who are more experienced than yourself 
um, and, and just be able yeah. to provide that level of support that the person needs at the Absolutely. moment where, where it becomes obvious either by uh, something that's witnessed or, or something that's confided in the staff that there is an issue. And uh, well, I, I like that terminology too, that, uh, you know, the first aid for, uh, for mental health. It just allows the opportunity for there to be a triage um, um, for the for the process. So, you know, um, as as you just said, there's sixties that there's a you know a, a lot of these staff will be the first touch point and the um, and the first people exposed to um, some potential challenges that any players might be facing. So having um, having them undertake that training and and as I said, making it it's now being mandatory for all staff. It, it means that there's uh, an elevated standard within the club, and hopefully, it's a it's a step to um, you know you're never going to eliminate it, but you know you, 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 we can solve some challenges and, and and provide help to people who needed it at, at an earlier point than maybe what we did previously. Yeah, congratulations to the Eels on that. It, it's I think it's something that they can feel very proud of. Finally, fellas, we'll wrap up our Eels news with referencing. A Fox Sports article, which amazingly, um, I haven't checked today, but as of yesterday, it had been up there for a number of days, been uh, available online to read. It hadn't been corrected. It hadn't been taken down. Um, but the journalist, uh, Fox Sports journalist Mark St. John, had written on the Eels prospects for 2024 uh, it look it's a, it's a reasonably formulaic uh, article which you can imagine would be could be done for every club and you know the people that are under pressure where the strengths and weaknesses of the team are um, how things look for the coaches etc cetera, etc cetera. but in this particular article we saw a listing of BA's coaching staff and it just so happened that what was listed was the 2013, I repeat, the 2013 coaching staff to the extent that Justin Holbrook was listed as Parramatta's NYC <laughs> coach for, for next year. So not only is Justin Holbrook suddenly back at Parramatta, but the NYC competition is up and running again, apparently. So... <laughs> Let's just say the fact checking on that and the editorial control maybe not so good, um, but wouldn't you think someone would have jumped in and either pulled it or or just got rid of how well we, we can only speculate as to how that piece those that information stayed in there, um, yeah, but n not good, not good Fox Sports, not good, and we we can acknowledge. The good work that's done by broadcasters and the broadcast partners of rugby league, and and after all, we probably wouldn't have the level of the game to follow if there wasn't the broadcast revenue that comes into the NRL. That's that's just a statement of fact. It is the major revenue stream for the game. But come on, I mean, come on, really? Like that's just that's just pretty ordinary, isn't it? It's uh, very ordinary. Uh, not not even just going back a year to him getting it wrong, going back a decade. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I joked previously. If you're if you're Steve Murphy and Brad Arthur, you're a little bit filthy that your long service leave has just been completely wiped based on that article. <laughs> yes, well, um, Murph being the only person that is still well, he's the the one that they got right because he's still with the club. But <laughs> yeah, when you, when you've got Peter Gentle and, um, and, and Justin Holbrook referenced and uh, Pete, I think left in what would have been about 2016. 2016, or, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, Justin Holbrook. Well, he, I well think, he left at the, I think he left at the end of 2013 and then I'm, Andrew yeah. Webster took over as NYC coach in 2014. Yeah, and then Luke Burt just after that from memory. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's, uh, let's just say, come on, Fox Sports, lift the game there in the in the in in that journalism department. Can, but, uh, anyway, can, fellas, that brings us to the end of the Eels news. 40, 
Do your stuff. (laughs) 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 So... For those of you who are used to our uh, used to listening to our podcast, we've referenced that we will let you know the halfway point so you can go out and grab yourself a cup of coffee, go to the loo, whatever you need to do at the halfway point. Maybe if you're listening to this on your commute to and from work, this is maybe the point when you've arrived at work. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna give a little bit of a sound bite to let you know that we're halfway through. We're about to swap over to NRL. But man, forty! Come on, that was that the <laughs> best for today. Well, we we might just say to our to our listeners as well that uh, we've laid down the challenge to forty to come up with a unique sound identifier, a unique sound bite every week. So it's not going to be the same one every week. So um, you know, if, if if you want to give some feedback on that sound bite, make sure you add it down in the comments and uh, and and at forty twenty. Yeah, and. Let's not have suggestions like um, Spanish flea and baby elephant walk. Any of those, <laughs> any of those well, old too late. They're already on the list. Or Jeopardy. <laughs> have you? Have, have you? Is your mind working on this for I've, you? I've, I've, I've got some awful places I can go off this, so we're gonna have some fun. With it. <laughs> okay. Well, don't let fear hold you back. That's all I'll say. Oh, it, so it, it won't. It. I'm, I'm embracing all my internet knowledge, so it's gonna. We're gonna go to some real, real interesting spots. It's gonna be a, a multi, well, multicultural journey. Okay, oh, a multicultural fantastic. journey. I'm thinking also the glitz and the glamour of Vegas because that's the first thing that we want to talk about in the NRL news. Is we've had a little bit of a, a an early glimpse into how the NRL is likely to market their season opener in Vegas and it looks like it's going to focus on the brutality and the collision that is that is NRL rugby league football John good thing is it a good thing is it is it it's marketing the game the way we want it to be marketed yeah the the fast and the furious approach is probably the right way to sell it to the Americans Um, I did say to your boys because I hadn't seen the advert until you um you raised it on the run sheet so I quickly watched it and uh, I end up cracking up laughing while we're recording because this, the very second clip they show is Elliot Whitehead giving Dale Finucane, I believe it was, a concussion with a high shot from the shoulder to head. So <laughs> I said, I was telling you guys, that's very much in line with the uh, American sporting authorities who were very quick to penalise stuff on the field and take away all the fun on the field, but then will quickly turn it around and use it as advertising and promotion for the game. So they've gotten that part, right? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I thought it was a pretty solid highlights package. A lot of uh, great diving tries by our wingers in the corners. Some big hits, uh, selling the fact that it's you know big hits with no pads. Lots of you know full contact, high impact sort of uh, content. Um, I think it's probably probably the right way to go about it. And it was a you know we we got a in terms of NRL highlight packages. I don't think it was anything sensational because we're we're so used to them these days. But it on the whole it was a pretty solid reel, and I think it should do a pretty good job selling it to the uh, Americans, especially when you're not getting bogged. Like, that, there is not the time to explain the rules and all the intricacy, intricacy sorry, of the game. Uh, but yeah, just hype them up. And I think that's what that uh, video does. Well, Forty, you're a bit of an aficionado of American sports. So we'll, we'll definitely take your opinions very highly when it comes to that sort of marketing there. Clint, you you don't mind a bit of a deep dive into American culture? You've travelled a, around the United States in the past. What's your thoughts on the the way that it's going to be marketed to the American public? I think they've nailed the messaging. Um, no pads, no helmets, um, fast pace, absolutely appealing to the um, low attention span generation that exists these days and, um, you know, or, or the TikTok generation, if you want to call them as such, um, you know, I, 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 I think from a messaging perspective, they've got it absolutely spot on. It's just going to be hard to measure how effective it will be because it's about who it reaches. And, you know, I've, I've got some extended family or, or family through my wife, I should say, um, over in the U S specifically actually in Phoenix. So not too far away from Vegas mm. about it. That's, that's, that's about the same drive from Sydney to Newcastle. If people are wondering the distance, I've, I've done the drive a couple of times myself. And um, 
And I've, I've shown them rugby league before and, and, and their, their immediate reaction was, how is this game only um, big in Australia and the, um, and the north of England? This is incredibly entertaining. And um, I actually um, mentioned uh, uh, that the game was coming over there. And the first thing they actually said back to me, funnily enough, is like, when is your team playing? Because we don't want to go and watch unless it's your team. So, um, so that was pretty cool. So you might have to wait a few years yet for that one. Let's, let's see how they go. They, they go these first couple of years. But, um, you know, the, um, the appeal of the sport is absolutely there. It's, it's, it's something that if it gets in front of the faces of, of Americans, they love it. You know, um, and, 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 and the way in which um, it's been, in, been marketed for these, um, for these season opener. Um, I think it's spot on. It's just a matter of getting in front of the right audience. I, I know for a fact because I got a friend who was over at Legion Stadium um, only just last week watching the Raiders and the Jets play an NFL game, and they had the ads on oh, screen. Poor bastard. Um, there. Oh, so. my God. <laughs> wow. Well, like the context of a Raiders Jets game, uh, given that the Jets have lost their starting quarterback, who was a you know, star, but Jesus, that's like uh, watching the West Tigers and the Bulldogs play. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was a welcome surprise that Rugby League came on the screen. That was the first thing. That, 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 uh, that's when I got a message. Um, in, uh, I think it probably would have been about like 8 or 9.30 in the morning. So it, wasn't, it wasn't, certainly wasn't too early. It was, it was in the midst of work at the time. But um, he's gone, why am I watching an NRL ad at, 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 a, at a Legion Stadium? I'm just like, you've been living under a rock. You knew this information. So, um, <laughs> well, look, yeah, we it's, know- it's obviously getting attention already. We know that Rugby League has its American followers over there. It was something that really kicked along during COVID when the NRL was one of the first, if not close to the first, organised professional sport that was able to get back on its feet and provide sports entertainment for fans around the world. Uh, We've got our own correspondent in Ron Greep, who is... uh, what what state is Ron from, John? Can you remember off the top of was your it, head? Was, was, a, it, was it Illinois? Yeah, he's a Chicago, Chicago boy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Chicago. So, uh, so he's he's got the trip already planned, got the tickets and, bought, and he's happy Thanksgiving to you, Ron. If you're listening, mm-hmm. uh, if you're listening, I assume it'll be on Thanksgiving. Yeah. So um, Ron's taken along his partner, and he's also catching up with a couple of fellow uh, rugby league converts over uh, at, at the game, uh, a couple of fellas that he's uh, got to know online and uh, they're, all ca- they're all meeting in person for the first time there. Um, they bonded over the love of rugby league. I think you wonder oh, how many of those awesome. experiences are, are going to be happening over there. I'd imagine it's going to be a, a, an interesting combination of uh, Australian tourists going over there, maybe some mm. expats. That are getting to going there to watch the game. Um, you maybe also have the the people who are new um, converts to rugby league and are, and are there because they have a they've developed a genuine love for the game. And then of course you probably have the curiosity aspect as well. People who are going to, to see it because they're curious. What is this game? And maybe that's uh, what they're targeting with the uh, advertising campaign is to get those people that want to experience rugby league simply because of what they've seen and heard about it so uh we're looking forward to ron being able to give us the feedback on the on the experience down there in vegas after the events taken place we'll be uh featuring him on a podcast so looking forward to that okay now uh closer to home and the player market and surprise surprise guess which club we're talking about (laughs) The, the the one that doesn't seem to have a limit on how many players they will sign going into any season or the season two seasons ahead, um, the Bulldogs. So a couple of things happen around there. First of all, we got uh, Connor Tracy rumoured to be going there in 2025. Uh, we do have Talki Aho, who's not now going to be going there because of issues around a medical that he wasn't able to pass. And then, of course, it now is emerging today that Gus Gould is pursuing Adam Fanua Blake. And wouldn't you know, this was one of the things that we uh, postulated was was um, where 
Adam Fanua Blake might be heading when he was talking about he wants to come back to Sydney. <laughs> and the club, it just so happened, the club that we thought, where is he likely to be getting an offer? The Bulldogs. So, um, yeah, get him signed now, work out the details later. I think that seems to be the the way that they uh, are operating when it comes to um, things like salary cap or the or the um, top thirty roster, and good luck to them if they're if they are able to manage it, signing people when they're available, and then working out who to shed later, or working out how to balance the books later, but but they can successfully do it. Well, it's something that is obviously working for them. But here's the question, fellas. So I'll put it to each of you. Um, those players, if they pick up both of them, Connor Tracy, Adam Fanua Blake, are they huge difference makers for their premiership prospects? Um, let me actually let me dial it back a bit. First of all, are they value added? And then secondly, is the values so great that they change their premiership prospects when they arrive at the club? John, first off. I don't think there's any question that uh, Adam Fanil Blake especially is a value add, and Connor Tracy, I believe, is also a value add, uh, although his value comes in his utility uh, you know, sort of application, being able to play once, one to five, and also in the halves as the uh, uh, sort of supplementary or secondary playmaker. And we know Gus loves a utility. And goodness, do the Bulldogs love a utility. They, if, the, <laughs> if you are able to trade players in the NRL, the Bulldogs have created a market scarcity on utility players. They hold all the cards. You want a utility player? Come to us. But unfortunately, you can't trade assets in the NRL, so they're just hoarding all the utilities for whatever reason. Uh, but well, yeah. Brad Takarangi just came uh, was just played in the um, in the Pacific Cup for Cook Islands. Do so they want to give him a call as well? <laughs> I'm um, not ruling it out. I'm not ruling it out. <laughs> and look, if you get a prop like Adam Fanor Blake, there is no doubt that you're a better team. The problem is for the Bulldogs is that they're one six seven nine. Just none of that screams. Even with the acquisition potentially of Connor Tracy, we're talking because it's not we're talking potential because it's not a done deal yet. And it's still over a year away if that's the case. Uh, you're, you're talking about a team that does not have a strong spine, is still missing a frontline playmaker to be the field marshal, the general, the game manager, however you want to you know, label it. And you, know, you, you go across their spine, you've just paid fullback money for Stephen Crichton. Now you're talking about not playing him there after 12 months because the talk is that Connor Tracy will play fullback. So you, you guess you've got a good player in Stephen Crichton, but you're paying him marquee money to play. The, unfortunately, the least premium position in the NRL these days. It's, it has gone from being the most important and glamorous non-spine position to being, you know, a, a position where you sort of just throw whoever you can into the centres. And, and that might be news to Stephen Crichton that, hey, champ, you're you're only our short short term answer at fullback. If it, if if that was the case, mm. um, he'd probably so be somewhat unimpressed. If, if they do end up signing both. Um, yeah, of, of course they're a better team. I don't think it solves their problems, though. I think that they're still, at best, a fringe top eight side, and they're going to remain to be, at best, and this is a very generous at best, more likely to be a bottom quartile team than an upper half of the ladder team, uh, until they fix their spine and they get the playmaker and they have the ability to actually go you know, set for set, can contest field position and territory the way that the best clubs do. Uh, so that that's their problem. They can open the checkbook as much as they want. And obviously you, you hope that, if you're a Bulldog, you're hoping that Fanil Blake can be your Roy Asatasi or something like that in terms of being that, that talismanic signing that marks the turnaround. But they've got they've had a few attempts at a Roy Asatasi at this stage. Yeah, they certainly have. Clint, are you on board with 40 there that the Bulldogs' spine is their major issue? <laughs> Big time. And they know it too. You know, there's... Um, there's definitely an element, and we, we've seen this um, song sung by Gus before in the way that he just uh, went after targets when he was um, the head of football, general manager of football at the Penrith Panthers, um, and he didn't have any qualms in moving on um, players on long-term contracts and big money in order to facilitate the changes he wanted in any given year. And, you know, it, it definitely feels like a case of history repeating itself in that regard. I mean, if you're a Bulldogs fan, you're kind of hoping that the end justifies the means and it ends up um, similar 
uh, way that it did for the Penrith Panthers down the track. But you know, I, I you know I won't hold my breath on that one just yet. But yeah, you know, absolutely. The 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 spine is incredibly problematic, and you know, the it, it's been that way for a number of years. Even even in the successful years under Des Hasler, I mean, they didn't have names that screamed out um, or, or, or that were household names. They certainly had serviceable players around a bunch of players who were very elite in other positions um, that that supported the style of football at the time when rugby league, or we're going back about ten years ago now, um, was uh, a, a lot more uh, wrestle focused. But you know, thankfully, we've we've come out the other side of that style of footy and 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 move back to um, a, um, a more attacking-based uh, brand of rugby league in, in more recent ah. years, comparatively. Um, but yeah, look, you know, and, and until they get the, until they get a, a, a good seven, or at the very least, a very good half, um, and I'm not meaning to say that as, as an insult to either Toby Sexton or, or Matt Burden, but neither of those players are just at that level as halves at the moment. Um, you know, Matt Burden certainly is a, um, has proved himself as a high-quality centre, and a serviceable 5'8 in the right team. But, you know, um, those guys um, at the helm at the moment, they need a lot more support around them to, um, to, to, to be successful. And, and, and to, um, um, I guess, agree with what Forty said, you know, I'm bottom of the eight at absolute best, and I think that's a stretch. Okay. Now, we also have uh, one of the... Um, former Penrith players, because we mentioned some Penrith players there in uh, in what was happening at the Bulldogs, what has happened. Another former Penrith player who this time was found at the Sharks, we're talking Matt Moylan, it has emerged that he's off to the Lee Leopards in the English Super League, so he's parting ways with the Cronulla Sharks effective immediately. Uh, John, how do you think First of all, um, it's a smart move for Matt Moylan, you'd have to say. Probably a move that the judging from the reaction of supporters to Matt Moylan during 2023, it's a move that the club's probably happy with as well. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a trodden ground sort of topic, but he's the sort of player that will go to the Super League and do very well. Um, He wasn't a top-line NRL playmaker anymore. Uh, he still had moments, and when you still have moments in the NRL, it means you're going to be pretty good in the Super League. Uh, the other thing, too, from the Cronulla perspective is that he was blocking uh, young... I say young. I think he's still relatively young. Uh, sorry, that was my computer giving me a notification. Uh, Trindle, uh, the other half there, uh, blocking his pathway, and Trindle had been uh, doing really well in reserve grade and also been a good foil uh, in the, the sixth jersey uh, for the Sharks when he got his opportunities uh, with Moylan out. So no surprises that they're happy to move him on and get Trindle into a full-time capacity role. Um, I think this is probably the best thing for both parties. And, yeah, I don't think it un- it unclogs that uh, very uh, backlogged backline pathways that the Sharks have with a lot of players, including Connor Tracy, uh, being held out of first grade. But for Trindle in particular, though, it does get him into the NRL, and I think that's probably a good thing for the Sharks. And, Clint, I guess... When you're talking about players having to bide their time for maybe a little bit longer than is ideal in lower grades because there is someone that's blocking their pathway, it, it can be a tricky situation because, look, the Sharks have a number of these players who'd been locked up to multiple year contracts. But as we're seeing with Connor Tracy, uh, you know, he's, he's obviously, he and his management are, are looking around for where they can be when his deal is done because, you know, you look at the the length of contracts for the NRL uh, mainstays at Cronulla and they're there for a long time. Um, you know, it's uh, I guess it helps to clear up that pathway and I suppose reassure these lower-grade players that if you've signed with us for long terms, we're looking for you to be given your opportunities. Yeah, you know, um, Braden Trindle's the, the big winner out of all this, and you know, if if you see any sort of the uh, the online comments from Sharks fans, you'd, you'd say that they, they they feel like they've won the lottery themselves with this, and you know, that's not meant to be a um, a mark against Matt Moylan's name because he was a very good player for for a number of years in the NRL and, and, and achieved plenty, played Origin, played Test football, 
Um, you know, I think he did everything other than win a premiership. And, you know, he, he's, his time in the NRL was probably extended by that very good season that Cronulla had uh, when they finished second um, year before um, this season. And, you know, I, I think that resulted in a one-year extension for him. But, you know, um, it, it, it's probably the right time for him to go. You know, like, if, if you ask Sharks fans and, and, and probably me personally here, it, it probably should have happened a year earlier. And it was the time. Uh, it was time after um, Nico Hines had a very successful season, and, and Matt Moylan, obviously getting a little bit long in the tooth, um, explored different options there so they could get Braden Trindle in. But you know, um, he bided his time, and the opportunities come now. And um, you know, he, he, he's probably going to be all the better for it, um, given that he spent the back half of this season in NRL and already developing that partnership with um, with Nico um, in terms of playing minutes. And it just makes them all the all the more stronger as a partnership going into the 2024 season. And goodness knows the Sharks are already got one foot in the finals door, courtesy of the draw <laughs> that they've been gifted again this for, year. For, for, the, for the fourth consecutive year. And, and, and coincidentally, the fourth consecutive year where we only play them once in the regular season. I wonder if there's a correlation with those two things. Well, has to be. Has to be. <laughs> um now, the other club that we absolutely love talking about when it comes to the player market and and uh, some of the more interesting d- decisions that are made out in clubland is the West Tigers. And they're still on the forefront of news because apparently the uh, Justin Olam um, swap deal with, uh, with Sean Bloor is still on the cards. They're looking to make a some sort of arrangement with the Melbourne Storm. They do have a history there, of course, of coming up with swap deals with the Storm. They did manage to get hold of uh, Harry Grant for a year via a swap deal. So it's when you have news of this coming through or rumours of it coming through, you tend to think, well, yeah, there might be something on the cards there. And... Like I think it's fair to say Justin Olam at his best is genuine value added. Justin Olam 2023 version, not so much. Is that a tough call or or is that just being brutally honest? Yeah, you if you're in West Tigers HQ, there should be the red klaxons and the alarms just blaring. <laughs> like, wow, wow, wow. Um, the fact that he, that he being Olam was essentially exiled from first grade until the Melbourne Storm injury crisis in the NRL was so bad that Bellamy had to recall him, I think tells you everything you need to know about the situation. He's fallen off a cliff, and the odds of him getting back up to the top are not great. Um, the the West Tigers are I wouldn't say they've got a great backline, but they've got pieces in their junior Tupo, uh, the uh, fullback as well, whose name will lose me right now. Um, uh, that was the Buller. rookie uh, Buller, Dream Buller Sorry there you go uh, they've, they've got a couple of, And you know Stafford to, uh, to Is you know He's decent He had a big game was Against the Cowboys That one time But um, uh, They've got pieces there To make a decent back line I, I don't rate Sean Bloor massively So in that regard I think it's kind of like A, a piece of chaff For a, a used tissue Sort of deal uh, But At the same time Bloor at least is young Service balls A middle forward uh, you're going to have to pay. You're taking the, you'd assume taking the lion's share of a pretty solid contract if you're signing Olam. Uh, I, I just don't think it's the, the best use of their resources when they're in a rebuilding phase. But, Clint, we do have news that's been filtering through and has been made just that little bit more tantalizing via a social media response um, from a fella from another first grader, Bradman Best. But the talk is, is that that the the Tigers are going to be offering Luai a contract of around the $1.1 million per season mark for a a four-year contract. Now, that's significant money. It's Obviously, it is commensurate with elite playmaker money. The question is, first of all, is Jerome Luai an elite playmaker. We know he's elite. He's he's a premiership winner. He's uh, an international footballer. Um, he's and obviously um, has his experience at Origin as well. Uh, but his own coach said 
he hasn't had to lead a team around the park himself. So 1.1 million per season for four seasons. And that's the thing it would be locking in for four seasons. So if you've got it wrong, it's an expensive mistake, the West Tigers. So how, how do you think, Clint, that West Tigers supporters should feel? Should they feel buoyed by him potentially going to the uh, going to the Tigers? And secondly, what's your take on Bradman Best's social media response to the talk? All right. Well, there's a number of ways to slice and dice this particular one. And, 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 and to go back to the, the original question you, you, you had in their 60s, um, no, I don't think he is an elite playmaker. I think Ivan Cleary's assessment and public assessment is correct. Um, but let's not kid ourselves and, and, and say that he didn't do that for the sake of trying to um, lower artificially lower his players' value in the market so that other clubs are, are less tempted to offer him that so that the Panthers can then keep the partnership of um, Luai and Cleary together. Um, but um, um, if you're the Tigers, you, you, you have to be ready to, and, and, and willing to take a risk. Is this the right risk um, for them? At this price, uh, maybe as a player he might be, but at this price, no. But that's also part and parcel of the game that you have to play and they're going to have to make an offer like that to get someone. And then the question becomes, if not him, who? Um, And the answer to who is, uh, I don't know. So by virtue of of marketplace conditions, uh, they kind of put themselves into a, uh, back themselves into a corner where they almost have to make this type of an offer to a player like him. And given that other halves are are locked up long-term, you can kind of, I guess, rationalize to a point how they got to this position um, and and why they might think he's their man. Um, If you're Jerome Luai, you hands down take this deal. It's time to get paid. You've got three premierships. You're not, you're, you're, your stock is highest at this point. It's time to sell, baby. Um, he'd be silly not to. He'd be sacrificing um, you know, probably the better part of $500,000 to a million dollars over four years not doing this. Um, yeah. Life-changing money for um, almost anyone. You know, and it's, it would put him in the position that is, um, as a young father, um, he he could guarantee himself that he won't have to work again with that, that type of a deal. I think that would be a very wise decision in the grander scheme of his life when he's um, he's already won three premierships. We're not worrying about his quote-unquote legacy being ruined here. He'll have the, those to his name for the rest of his life. Um, so go, go get your cash. If you're the Tigers this and your Tigers fans, this should be a very familiar tale and something that has you worried and concerned. Um, and it makes you wonder whether you're, they're um, potentially making some of the same mistakes again, because as you quite rightly said there, 60s, um, if you get it wrong, four years is a long time to be paying that type of money. Um, so, you know, but th- they're in a position where they have to take a risk. And if they want to take their risk on Jerome Luai, um, then so be it. Go for it. Um, I don't think it's a risk that um, anyone watching from the outside looks on with any confidence. And it's absolutely at risk, uh, massive risk of being lol at Tigers yet again <laughs> with this. And I think um, I think it's um, riskier of, uh, or a higher chance of not working out than it is working out. But, you know, um, that's just the market situation at this moment. And, uh, you yeah, know, um, an unstoppable force um, meets an immovable object type of scenario. So, you know, it's, it's kind of marrying up both. Um, the, for the Tigers and Jerome Luai. Luai wants, uh, wants to get paid. Tigers have the means to do it. Tigers want a half with a, with a pedigree and a reputation. Luai's got that, albeit he hasn't necessarily manufactured that exclusively for himself. Um, you know, it kind of seems like on the surface it could match, at least initially. Yep, so 40. You've got Luai's got three premiership rings. He's... <laughs> He's heading to uh, an organisation that's been described as a bit of a circus in the past. So you've, you've got the three premier, three ring circus scenario there. And I guess he can feel proud about three premiership rings. Is he at risk of joining a club that's about to get their third wooden spoon in a row? 
It's a unfortunate for the Tigers. It is very much a possibility. Uh, what, what you got? It may be if you expect Redcliffe to go backwards massively, which I don't think is on the cards. You got the Bulldogs, St George. Um, I think the Gold Coast probably got too much talent to be in the contention for the spoon. Maybe Newcastle. You know, if, if it ends up being that that ten week run was you know just catching fire, and that was it, and they they sort of default back to who they've been for a few years. There are contenders for the spoon, but the, the Tigers unfortunately lead the pack. Um, and picking up Jerome Luai, while it's a big signing, uh, you talk about priorities, right? And we, we were chastising the Bulldogs about going after a prop and a utility fullback ahead of their, their priority need as a halfback. And it's very much the same thing with the West Tigers. Luai, there's no doubt he's a talented player. I imagine that Benji sees shades of a young version of himself there in terms of the ability to be explosive off the left and right foot, carve up and broken play, be a threat running the ball. But Jerome Luai is being sheltered by the you know strongest spine and middle field playing unit when you're talking about Nathan Cleary, Isaiah Yo, Dylan Edwards, uh, and you know the dynamic edge forwards in Liam Martin and before that, Viliami Kikau, uh, that have been out at Penrith. They've been able to create an environment for him to play the perfect round of football to take advantage of his skills. And I don't think the West Tigers can offer that. Um, I understand they do need to make a signing. Like you, you cannot just sit treading water as the West Tigers. You need to make a splash. I just feel like this is not their guy. So, yeah, the, the free rings uh, for the premiership, the free rings for the circus, and maybe just the free wooden spoons <laughs> coming their way. Yeah, and look, just as a um, an acknowledgement, as Parramatta supporters... We've been there. We know what it's like to be sitting down the yeah. bottom of the of the table for multiple seasons, and we're not looking too far back when we're talking about back to back spoons. Uh, when we're looking at um, uh, twelve and thirteen, two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen, the two thousand eleven. I think we finished second last, and then twelve and thirteen, the spoon. Yeah, Jared and- Jared Hayne beat the Gold Coast Titans, didn't he? In uh, the last round, twenty eleven, twenty eleven yeah. to. To flip yeah. the spoon around. Yeah. Um, Luke Burt might have even featured in that game at halfback. At halfback, you're right. You he are did, right, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, and let's also be honest that the calibre of player that West Tigers are attracting at the moment is far and away higher than the calibre of player that the Eels were attracting back in 2012-2013. When we were overpaying for players who were close to retirement, or would have been a regular in uh, reserve grade at most other clubs, and we were really paying through the nose for some of these players. So, um, yeah, the the Tigers are probably doing a little bit better on the recruitment front, but the, the, again, the game has changed a little bit even in the last ten years, and we also acknowledge. And uh, again, it's the shout out to our, to any West Tigers supporters out there that, first of all, you've got great resilience in sticking with your team during these times. And we also acknowledge that it's not always the players that are the reasons for the, the club struggling on certain fronts. There's strange decisions that seem to go on around the Tigers. Sometimes it is recruitment decisions. Um, other times it's been coaching appointments or sackings or just the general demeanour around the club that something just doesn't quite feel right. Um, at some point, you're going to come up the ladder. If um, Okay, so here's a quick call. All you have to say is yes or no on this one. It's not too hard. To, to <laughs> There's only one way to go if you're sitting on the bottom. If they added Luai, first of all, Clint and John, would the Tigers climb the ladder? And secondly, would they climb into the top half of the ladder? John, first of all, you. This do they f- climb the ladder? For season 2025, right? Um, yes. Uh, so do they climb the ladder? I, I think Luai is probably worth a, a win or two for the West Tigers as much as I was panning the signing. So I think they arguably do climb the ladder. Okay. Do they climb to the top half of the ladder? No. Okay. Clint, do they climb the ladder? Yes. Do they climb to the top half of the ladder? Definitely not. Okay. 
So we're, let's wrap up the West Tigers there. I'm sure we'll be coming back to them next week about something. Uh, finally, <laughs> uh, it, it looks like that at the end of this season, the partnership between Steggles and the Roosters <gasps> is over. It's over. Yeah, you know what? As much as we like to shit on the Roosters and make fun of our salary cap, that is actually an iconic NRL combination. And mm, the, fact, yeah. the fact that it's over is actually, it's not a big deal, but like, it kind of, it's the end of an era. Yep, true. True. I mean, imagine having a sponsor that looks like your mascot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just perfect. <laughs> like, the colours match, yeah. the, the logo, like, you know, is is literally a brother or sister logo. Uh, it's, it is literally the most on-brand you're ever going to get. Yeah, it, it is the end of an era. Um I guess that's uh, the modern world. Maybe uh, have they indicated why that it, it's coming to an end? I I didn't see. So uh, it, look, it, it, it's not uncommon with some of these um, principal partnerships that they're just taking a step down as opposed to severing ties with the club. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. And it's most likely because the Roosters have someone willing to pay a bit more up their sleeve, and Steggles uh, has probably indicated that they've got. Um, a, a certain amount that they're willing to contribute and they're not going to go above that number. And I, I would assume it's probably something to do with that because you wouldn't make an announcement that you're mutually um, um, agreeing to uh, that it'll be your last season as a major partner. It would just be something that would happen without a club announcement. So I dare say it's 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 done because it's recognising the, the length of the partnership but that they will pro- likely still be involved in some capacity, even if that means just as like a, a secondary sponsor, be it on the shorts or um, or even just like um, like a membership or training kit um, type sponsor or even just um, a, a, a commercial partner who has a box there. Who knows? Okay. Well, I, fellas, I think I think that just about wraps us up. How do we go time-wise, John? What are we looking at? Uh, only an hour seven, which honestly is not that bad considering the amount of topics that we added to the run sheet between recordings. You know what? I'm impressed. I don't impress easy, but I'm impressed <laughs> about ourselves tonight. There you go. <laughs> so thank you, John and Clint, for tonight. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners, especially those that like to give us a bit of feedback. We really do appreciate you, first of all, listening, and then secondly, taking the time to give us a bit of feedback on the shows. Uh, thank you, of course, to our sponsors, uh, Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellan and Parramatta, and Big Swing Golf at North Mead. Um, if you can, people, get out there, support the people that support the Eels and the Cumberland Throw, and um, yeah, just get behind them, because without them, we're not able to do what we do on a weekly basis and 12 months a year. So, again, thank you to those sponsors. And as I always say, fellas, go you mighty eels.